the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, and we read from verse 29. Mark chapter 1, we read from 29 up to 34. It reads as follows. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve her. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the word of the Lord. A blessed assurance. You may be
transgress with the ways of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my Lord and my Savior. We are saved to be servants. This is what I want you to take out of this service this morning. If it happens that you forget anything of what I intend saying this morning, just remember that we are saved to be servants. I'm going to do a little bit of two things. Last year, towards the end of the year, we stopped our rainy day Bible studies. And I want us to continue with that this morning. I will do a little bit of preaching, but mostly more of explaining and interpreting what the word says to us today under that theme. We are saved to be servants. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, it should be remembered that the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Mark, is the shortest of all the gospel writings. It has got only 16 chapters. But it is regarded as the most direct, clearer, and not confusing at all. It is believed by the Bible scholars that the other Gospels, that is Matthew and Luke, were derived from, and therefore they are actually extracts of the book of Mark. In trying to describe Mark's Gospel, separate from the other Gospels, they refer to it as the Gospel of the Hear, and not. Mark is not confusing. He relates when he relates this story. He doesn't even mix his ways. And he confronts these issues in a clear and direct manner when there was an item to be raised or to be put across. I want you to observe this simple yet clear and direct presentation in his opening statement of his book, that is chapter 1, verse 1. He says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Close quote. Friends, the opening word of Mark's gospel is the word, the beginning. And I want you to underline that which also translates Alpha, meaning God. So the message here is clear to the reader that don't be confused. The good news I'm relating to you is about Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, who is the Son of God. Right from the beginning, he doesn't want you to be confused and maybe start suspecting things that are not there. And if you read carefully, he is also trying to show you, the reader, the connection between the first book of the Bible canon, which is Genesis and the Gospel of John. Now, if you read Genesis, the opening words of Genesis chapter 1 and the opening words of the Gospel of John chapter 1, you are going to hear almost the same phrases and the same words being used. So his selection of words in the first chapter are the same words used by the writers of Genesis and John, respectively. He's trying to say everything, every word, every act, Every teaching in this book and story I am writing is the fulfillment of everything which was said right from the beginning. J. 
Jesus Christ is an embodiment of what we should mark. He is an embodiment, he is a result and an end product of all which God had promised in the Torah or in the Old Testament. The first thing he points out is the relationship and the intimacy between God the Creator and Jesus Christ the Savior. In the preceding verses, Mark speaks about the word in the wilderness. And the word here is the logos of God, the word of God, the word which spoke through the formlessness, the word which spoke through the shapelessness, the word which spoke through the void and the darkness which was there in the beginning. And, and this word, this logos said, let there be light. And there was light. So Mark speaks about that word that was there. That word which John refers to as the herald, the word that precedes the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. From there he proceeds to relate the story of Jesus' baptism. But actually, this story is not about baptism, as you and I know and understand it. It is actually a confirmation and a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. It is a statement which seeks to say, truly God has tabernacled among his people. He will be their God, and they will be his people. The baptism, my friends, the baptism of Jesus at the Jordan River is one of the few episodes and biblical evidence where you get to see but also get to experience the teaching of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because it is in the baptism of Jesus Christ where we are told that Jesus went into the river and as he was there as the son, as the savior of the world, then what happened is the heavens were opened and the spirit of God in a form of a dove descended upon Jesus Christ. So we see the son, Jesus Christ, but we also see the dove, the Holy Spirit, which is in a form of a dove, descending upon the sun. And as if that is not enough, then the gospel says, then the word came from the opened heavens and said, this is my son with whom I am pleased. And that word, that, say, that say, said those words, uh, is actually the word that says, let there be light. So it is in the baptism of Jesus Christ where we get to hear the word affirming and saying, this is my son, but we see the Holy Spirit, but we also see the son. And this is some of those few texts in the Bible where you will get to see clearly the, the Holy Spirit and the Trinity as it is explained. This section of scripture that we have read this morning is against the backdrop of the arrest of John the Baptist. Then we see Jesus coming from, from Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. And as he comes, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And along the Sea of Tiberias, we see Jesus Christ calling the first four disciples, Peter and his brother, Andrew. Then further down, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. Now the question I want to put to you is, why did he call them? Why did he 
he discipled them? Why did he save them? And the answer to that is, we are saved to be saved. He called them so that they, should, they can become servants. And after calling them, he takes them through an instruction session in a synagogue at Capernaum. For they needed to understand Jesus' teaching and actions in line with what they have learned in the Torah, in the Old Testament, the books of the law and the books of the prophets. From there, beloved in Christ, the journey takes us to Bethsaida. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They accompany the Lord as he visits the sick Peter's mother-in-law, who was lying on her deathbed because of him. We are saved to be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one scripture which informs us that the chief apostle, Simon Peter, was a responsible, loving, and caring husband, a married man. Nowhere else in the scripture you are going to be directly told that Peter was married. But how do we know that he was married? It is because scripture tells us that his mother-in-law was sick and dying with him. But one thing we all need to observe here, my friends, is that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Mark tells us that this good news deals, deals with families and family life. Look at this. Look at this. After Andrew has encountered Jesus, he goes on to inform his brother. Can you see the family there? It is Andrew who encounters Christ first. And then he goes and tells his brother, Simon Peter, he said, I have encountered the Lord. And Peter comes to the knowledge of Christ. The two of them end up being amongst the first disciples of Jesus Christ. And along the banks of the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus meets with another family. He meets with the hard-working Zebedee and his sons, James and John, who were busy fishing. So Jesus is actually interested in families and family life. Now here we see Peter. Peter introducing his mother-in-law to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Can you see the family connection? I want you to sit there if you see. I want you to relax. I want you to reflect. Can you recall? Can you recall? Can you recall who did you introduce to Jesus Christ through the church? And how long ago it was? Can you, just one person, can you remember one person that you introduced to Jesus Christ? in the church. And if you did, how long ago it was? Andrew introduced Peter. And Peter introduced his mother-in-law and probably his wife and the rest of his in-laws also. For Christ's sake, can you recommend, can you recommend, can you next week, can you next week introduce just one soul, one soul 
Can you can you take the whole of this week just looking for one person, encourage one person to come to the house of God? Friends, we're living in unprecedented times, surrounded by sickness and death every day and every time. The beauty is that death we do not fear. Because we have been saved by grace through faith, so says the Reverend John Wesley. Our salvation is not for fun, no. Our salvation is not for fun. We are saved to be servants. The only way to demonstrate, to affirm and confirm our salvation, the only way to express our gratitude is to become servants. We can't be saved and enjoy the fact that we are saved. And there is no way in which we express and demonstrate that. Now, one day I will explain and unpack the meaning of servant leader. Not today. But for now, please hold on to the theme we are saved to be servant. I want to conclude by asking you to look into that house. Look into that house of a nameless woman, because the Bible doesn't even give us a name. Look into that house of a nameless woman, a house of sadness, a house of weariness, a house of hopelessness, a house of sickness, loneliness, and death. As this poor woman was about to give up and give in to dying, what she didn't know is that her son-in-law, Simon Peter, had encountered the healer, a true physician. She didn't know that her son-in-law had encountered Jehovah Rapha, God, who is our healer. And this healer, the Bible tells us, he stepped into the house. He took the sick woman by her hand, lifted her up. Then the fever left her immediately. Listen to this. When the light comes in, darkness is quiet. When the light appears, death dies. When joy enters, sadness and sorrow flies out immediately. And Jesus Christ is the light. Jesus Christ is the life. Jesus Christ is joy. Jesus Christ is everything and anything that you can be. And when he comes and touches it, then all sorrow goes out. And it is for that reason that I'm saying to you, Encourage just one person and introduce just one person to the Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately, the fever left her. And, and when that happens, she stood up and immediately served Jesus from the dead to being a saint. Because we are saved to be saved. And may God bless you this as you understand that your salvation was not for fun, but brought for a purpose. And the purpose is that you stand up. If the Lord has touched you, you stand up and you serve Him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
into your time of sorrow. In Jehovah Jireh, his provision will be sent in your life. God will make you good. God comforts you. God survives you. God will lift you. God will comfort you. God will be with you. With every step that you take, God will be with you. With every decision that you make, God will be with you. God protects you from all sickness, from danger, sin, and unseen. God protects you. Keep you secure. Keep you safe. And all that belongs to you. And all that belongs to you, God, be with you. And with everything that concerns you. May his provision be seen, evidence, witnessed in your life. God be with you. God strengthen you. God place his hand of comfort on your life. Wherever you might be right now, whatever you might be facing right now, whatever might be coming against you. Amen. 